Today in the podcast, I have a lovely lady who runs a, a really important charity in Haiti. But more than that, she was a professor at Lawrence State University, or Lawrence University, I should say. Um, her name is Janet Anthony, and she comes from Wisconsin. Um, just to give you a breakdown of her background in brief, uh, she studied in Vienna and the USA. You know, you've traveled across the world, performing on stages everywhere. You regularly appear in Wisconsin Public Radio, and of course, you play the most beautiful instrument, the cello. One of my favorite instruments. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, I'd love to get to know the person behind this amazing bio, you know, bio that you've built up over the years of like traveling all over the world, creating this amazing charity that's having impact in Haiti. So how did the cello come into your life? When did you start learning the cello? Well, I was a late bloomer. I started out with the piano. My dad uh, was a musicologist, so we had okay. music in the house. We were lucky in that in that regard. Yeah. Um, I grew up in Arizona, uh, in the, the desert southwest of the United States. Uh, and I love my piano teacher, uh, Winnie Knight, and uh, she had a stroke um, after I had been studying with her for four or five years and, and was not able to continue. And my folks switched me to somebody else. The only thing I remember about her is that she had really long hair, which was fascinating to me as a kid, but yeah. I, didn't like, I didn't like the piano so much. So when I was um, uh, uh, in grade school here, uh, music at that time was offered starting in in the fourth grade the fourth, okay. fourth year of school and mm -hmm. i picked up the cello and i started with lessons uh when i entered uh eighth grade so mm -hmm. um i started lessons when i was 13 or 14 years old and yeah. had a teacher who just lit me on fire and, really uh, yeah is that amazing for that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Really, really and good. how how did your teacher light you on fire? Like, what was so fascinating about the musical world and your teacher, perhaps, that lit you on fire? Well, she is a, a young woman. She was a student at the local university, and um, I so admired her. I loved her playing, and she really just pushed me to to do more. And I was very happy to be pushed. So. Yeah, yeah. And what is it about the music world that you adore? I mean, people have all different kinds of reasons, you know, that they like music you know, what's your reason? Well, I think music speaks to uh, a part of ourselves that words can't reach. Uh, that's mm -hmm. one thing. And through music, we, uh, we can meet people from all over the world and communicate yeah. with them as, uh, as equals and mm -hmm. um, are on an equal footing. Uh, and that to me is incredibly important as well. It's just as a means of communication. I mean, you have a beautiful quote here, and I mean, many people have said the same thing, but I just love the words you use here. You've said in one of your blogs that music of all types is a potent tool of communication. And through music, we can move to feelings and emotions beyond the capacity of words. I think that says it all, really, doesn't it? You know, the it power of music, really. Yeah. yeah. So you really got lit on fire, as you say, with the cello when you were in school. And then following that, I presume you entered the world of university and all of that. And did you take up music as a main subject at that time? Yeah, I did. I um, was a music, uh, what we call in the States, a music major. And I um, met um, a wonderful Austrian violinist and and wound up going to Vienna. I spent three and a half years, almost four years in oh, Austria goodness. at a time when, um, <laughs> this dates me for sure, but uh, there were three orchestras in Europe that did not allow women. Two of the three. Oh my goodness. Us. Isn't and that yeah, a different world? Women. I That's know. Different world. Yeah, totally different world. Berlin Phil, Vienna Phil, Vienna Symphony. But I played with every other orchestra in the city. That would allow you in, Vienna. basically. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. it was a fantastic experience for me. Um, yeah. Just fantastic. And then I went back to the States and got my master's and landed uh, in Wisconsin, where I taught for 34 years at Lawrence University, as you said. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was looking at the whole thing about Lawrence University. And I mean, I was reading a paragraph here now. I'm just glancing over here at a screen over here. So if you see me looking over here, that's what I'm looking at. It's a, founded in 1847. Lawrence University uniquely integrates a college of liberal arts and sciences with a nationally recognized conservatoire of music both devoted exclusively to undergraduate education. What I think is really interesting here is how it integrates the liberal arts and sciences. Can you talk more to that? Oh, uh, that was one of the absolutely fabulous things about teaching there. We often um, had students who were brilliant in 
physics or in chemistry or in literature or in whatever, and also incredible musicians. I think the school attracts thinking musicians, if you will, um, yeah. and people who are um, sort of primed to take off in that kind of environment uh -huh. that honors both uh, their capacity as musician, musicians, excuse me, and their capacity intellectually, both as musicians and as people outside of outside of that realm. It was so exciting for me. Yeah, I mean, I've seen that even in my own, ex it. yeah, in my own experience of music, what I find is that those people who have a very strong leaning towards like physics and all these other subjects, very often they're excellent musicians and they have, they have a huge knowledge concerning music. It just seems the two worlds collide very well. Well, science and music, I think, do fit very well. Yeah, together. they do. Quite Einstein very well. adored music and uh, was not a terrible violinist. <laughs> in addition to being an incredible physicist, I think I think those worlds uh, collide frequently. And yeah. often, my my strongest students were what we call double degree seeking uh, yes. students. So they would get a BA in physics or in chemistry or in whatever and, then and the arts is just like this beautiful sweetness of life that they can express away from all this really intense yeah. study if you will in a sense so you were professor there you're now retired and um but before i get into that you traveled the world performing i mean what are your most memorable experiences performing worldwide i mean you've gone to countries all over the world well, they're all um, they're all incredibly interesting and and fascinating. And again, music is a way to communicate with people, uh, even if you can't speak their language. Uh, in Vietnam, the you know the classes that uh, that we gave some of the teachers spoke Russia spoke um, they had studied with Rostropovich in Moscow, but they spoke French because the French, of course, had occupied uh, Vietnam up until 1956 right. or so okay. when the United States. Yeah. <laughs> So I could communicate with them in French, but um, it's really more, uh, 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 you know, when you teach an instrument, so much of it is demonstration anyhow. There's mm -hmm. not, uh, you can get by without a lot of talking if there's goodwill on both sides. And yes, yeah. and things like the that. sound is the thing that you want to achieve, that dream sound, isn't it? That dream yeah, sound. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you know, just before I get into the story about your amazing charity, um, you know, for students who would love to enter the world of Lawrence University or would love to get in the concert stage, what is the major piece of advice you'd give those students or those people that would love to perform at the level you've experienced? Well, I think um, if young people are really passionate about what they're doing and, and really want this, it's, it's not an easy life, obviously, um, but if, if you can't do anything else, <laughs> uh, if you'd be unhappy doing anything else, then I think the most important thing as a young person is to find a teacher uh, with whom you you resonate and with whom you have confidence and who can guide yeah. you in the yeah. steps along the way. And I mean, nowadays there's so many workshops available online that people can access to enhance their skill. I mean, I was just on with somebody else in the last couple of weeks, Grammy Award winning pianist. And I mean, she's running workshops that any people, you know, anyone can attend. And I mean, think of the knowledge that you pick up from people like them as an extra to whatever you're studying or whatever you're focused on at that particular time. There's wonderful, you know, opportunities there now with this online world. So um, moving on to this charity that you are leading, um, it's called Bloom, uh, Building Leaders Through Music Education, and you're focused on Haiti. That's right, we, building leaders using music education. Using music that's education. Right. So that's an interesting, you know, marriage of skills. So with Haiti, I think the world knows that Haiti has been through so many challenges, whether it be political disasters, you know, natural disasters. And then, of course, people don't have much, really, for the most part. Um, so how did your journey into Haiti begin? Well, that happened, you know, <laughs> Uh, some of your uh, listeners might know Snoopy, the wonderful Charles Schultz character, Charlie Brown and Snoopy. As Snoopy would say when he started his great American novel, it was a dark and stormy night, and it was. Uh, in Wisconsin, in the winter, I couldn't sleep, and so I was reading absolutely every single ad in the back of a trade publication called String, Strings Magazine, which is an awesome magazine for strings players. And, um, 
There was a teeny, teeny, tiny ad up in the corner of one page um, that said, uh, shallow teacher needed for a music festival in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And I speak French and I thought, wow, that could be really interesting. So I contacted the person who put me in touch with um, a man named John Jost, uh, who was really the heart and soul of the Holy Trinity Music Camp for many, many, many years. He had to, let's see, 30, for about 45 years, 40, 45, 46 years. And yeah, um, uh, yeah that, uh, that first summer, um, something clicked. And except for the pandemic, I've been back every year since. And, you know, traveling into Haiti's world, we'll say, it's a completely different world to what we know. And, you know, when somebody arrives in the country, like what is the first experience you expect to see? What is it like on the streets there? Well, um, in terms of the sensory experience, it, it can be overwhelming for some people, mm -hmm. uh, especially now Haiti is in, um, as you mentioned, uh, uh, difficulty for all kinds of, of reasons. And yeah. uh, so it's hot and uh, uh, trash pickup is not always regular. Uh, mm. the, your senses are overwhelmed with with that also. Uh, that once mm. you people get to their destination, I mean, there's not a lot of tourism, frankly, yeah. in Haiti at the moment. So Royal Caribbean has started their cruise ships again to the north, to La Badie. That's where the piano we were speaking about earlier is uh, has just arrived. Um, oh my goodness, the piano. So you're moving a piano to Haiti. Yeah. <laughs> a Bechstein yeah. piano, beautiful. That, yeah. that's it. that must be so exciting for the Haitian people to see this amazing piano coming in. That must be amazing. Yeah, it's very yeah. exciting. The, the um, It's not a concert grand. It's, um, I think, five feet 11, if I'm not mistaken. Right. But, two Baldwin concert grands that were in Port-au-Prince, the capital, were unfortunately, uh, one was completely destroyed by the oh, earthquake. No. And the mm -hmm. other that happened in 2010, the Haiti's oldest music school, uh, the Holy Trinity Music School, um, was completely destroyed in that. Oh, no. Uh, the yeah. concert hall and, and the music building and all of that. And so one piano was uh, was saved, and uh, yeah. a couple of piano techs have been down there to work on it. It's not um, in exactly the kind of shape it needs to be in, but uh, it'll get there. So this is for the north uh, mm -hmm. part of the country, and um, and will uh, be of incredible service there. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. But just to back up a bit, so you know, when you arrive in Haiti, you're getting all these sensory experiences. But then when we look at the people of Haiti and you see the challenges that they're in, and then you're bringing with your charity, you're bringing in this whole aspect of marrying the music world with building leadership. Explain that process and what kind of impact you've had through your charity. Well, so we walk hand in hand with our partners. We're definitely not a top-down organization. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's lateral, it's side by side. We listen to the program directors um, and their teachers and their students and do what we can to help meet their needs or brainstorm, help them brainstorm to find ways uh, to meet their needs because our resources are somewhat limited. But uh, music, uh, learning music, teaching music, um, I think also is uh, goes in partnership with building leadership skills. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I you know with, with music, you gain self-confidence, you learn how to focus, you learn how to concentrate, oh, completely. you have to work harmoniously with others mm -hmm. if you're yes. in an orchestra, band, or choir setting. All of those skills, uh, uh, problem solving, all of those things uh, uh, coalesce in, in music education. And really, it's not necessarily to create virtuoso players, though there are plenty of extraordinary talents uh, in yeah. Haiti. It's more to help with the structure of, of civil society, which yes. is also yeah. greatly needed. And I mean, how many years have you been in existence now? You may have said it earlier, but how many years now? So we were formed as a result of the 2010 earthquake and okay. our official formation date actually we're coming up on our 10th anniversary on June 28th. Oh, so, exciting. So it's, it's very 10 years. Exciting. Yeah, big celebrations. And when we see the change that's happened in the music ecosystem across the country, it really is quite extraordinary. That's amazing. Um, you must have impacted some lives that like that. 
I, you know, I've heard stories of people in Mexico just recently and they come into a charity where they get music education alongside their school education. And it brings people out of environments that otherwise would have no opportunity of moving beyond their community because they're so agriculturally based. The, you know, you can imagine the schooling systems are, you know, practically non-existent. So have you seen that yourself with your work that you're bringing people into your fold, as it were, and, and bringing them on, helping them to blossom? Well, there are a number of people who have told me that quite literally music had saved their life. Yeah. Uh, they grew up in some of these really difficult, challenging slums and music enabled them to earn their living and to 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 create new lives for themselves. Other options, other possibilities, um, optimism, it brings all kinds of, of mental uh, health and things. just, yeah. yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, moving on. What is your biggest need? Now, I hear from charities that I interview here in this podcast, oh, our biggest need is funding. I get that. Funding is major. But when you look at maybe skills or musicians that may are be looking for opportunities where they want to give back through their skill, um, what kind of opportunities that have you for people like that? And where can people help out in the best way apart from the funding, which we know is a big thing? Funding is always huge, yes. For any nonprofit, <laughs> it is. Need more money. <laughs> and every nonprofit probably does, or most of them. Yes. Um, well, we have a number of really interesting programs. And one of them that uh, is going full steam ahead right now is uh, with instrument repair. We've had a long partnership with an organization called Youth Years Without Borders. It was founded in Belgium by um, a Belgian string instrument maker, and their UK branch has been extraordinary. They've had nine missions to Haiti. I met them in 2008 uh, and helped them with their very first trip to Haiti, and uh, they've come back, as I said, uh, eight times after that. And as a result, there are four highly professional luthiers in Haiti, of all places. It's not what one would expect. Yeah. And almost every program with string instruments has access to somebody who can at least maintain the stock right. of instruments and they can be sent to one of these um, four really quite good luthiers if the repair is more extensive. And so we're doing now the same thing with uh, wind instruments, uh, thanks to a partnership with another Belgian based group called Music Fund. And uh, we've already had I think it's oh, close to 120 participants in the first of four modules with a Haitian teacher who spent Amazing. several months in Belgium uh, getting trained himself. He's also a fine luthier. He was involved in a number of, of the Luthiers Without Borders programs that we sponsored. Yeah. Yeah. So um, our goal is to have every all 10 of Haiti's uh, departments, provinces, if you will, have somebody who can maintain uh, wind instruments and then have three major centers of repair it really it really capital. sounds it really sounds as if you're setting a very high standard which is fantastic because that's where excellence comes from then when you're thinking of leadership skill in general um that you're well, really yeah making, that's, you know that's creating because like it's not you know the way you hear stories sometimes of people trying to help but the standards might be great i mean it's when you have standards of excellence position they are quite a high threshold you've great opportunities then to have great leaders so well, and um, I think it, it does people a real disservice to um, dumb down, if you will, uh, what it is that you're bringing. I mean, Haitians are as capable as Americans or Irish yeah. people or French or whatever. Resources are different and yeah. access to resources are, are not the same, but the innate capacity is mm. absolutely there and you know do you run apart from doing the music classes then in haiti do you run classes to do with leadership personal development you know trauma counseling because i'm sure there's people there that have experienced some forms of trauma you know given the nature of life there right we don't have uh, expertise in uh helping people with trauma but we do obviously offer music as a as a means uh for healing but it's not guided by any one of us as, um, so would you like if somebody with music therapy professional skills knocked on your door would you make things happen to to maybe offer something that, like that? could that could well happen and it would be um i imagine much more effective if that person spoke at least french if not if not right real. so french is a pretty um, yeah it's the requirement yeah. yeah i mean for something like that where you're dealing with a therapist 
therapeutic side of um, healing, uh, it, it seems like language would. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. So, and I, it would be possible to get translators, but um, yeah, again, that's not my area of expertise. I'd have to talk with a person to see if, mm. if something like that would be even feasible. But yes. yeah, there are tons of people who've been through lots of very, very challenging situations. Yeah, because I was just listening to a couple of interviews recently. One was Lady Gaga um, in particular. And to hear her life story, apart from her public appearance, as it were, um, herself and Oprah were speaking about trauma and how that when people experience trauma in their youth, whatever, how it can come up in later years and cause havoc and that there is a way of dealing with this and getting through it and moving on with life. So that's why I asked that question. Mm -hmm. Now, just making reference, you mentioned something about your father. You said he was a musicologist. Now, some people listening to this podcast mightn't even know what that subject deals with. Could you just explain the definition of what that's all about? So music uh, is music. Ology is the study of. So it's the study of music. In his case, it was music of the French Baroque. Uh, right. So music in France from 1600 to 1750 or so that he was sort of lost in the French Baroque. It was fabulous. Um, yeah. But there's also ethnomusicology, so the study of music of people. Okay. And um, uh, we have uh, an ethnomusicologist on our board, actually, who's spent a great deal of time in Haiti and studied in particular um, um, Pentecostal uh, expressions of faith yeah. through music. Um, um, and uh, when I was a professor at Lawrence over the years, I took about 70 students with me to Haiti. And uh, two of those, I think, became ethnomusicologists. Wow, as well. that's interesting. Um, Fascinating. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, it, it sounds that there's opportunities there for people to dig into this kind of format of study because there's so much world music out there that really, I don't think there's much information on some of it. And it needs further study. I mean, yeah. if you, I presume in Haiti, there must have some very deep cultural music there. I mean, is somebody studying that in depth to try and document that and, you know, bring it into that area? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, you know how the French say they have a cheese for every day of the year, 365 cheeses or whatever. Um, in Haiti, you could relate that to drum patterns, dances and songs. Yeah. Um, having to do with the, the African uh, religious tradition mm -hmm. that are, sort of grouped together as voodoo um, yeah. and folkloric music and things like that. It's just fascinating. One of our um, Boom Haiti scholars actually, who uh, wound up at Lawrence as a non-degree seeking student, wound up getting his bachelor's uh, uh, in Wisconsin and is now working on his master's at McGill and Coral conducting phenomenal talent. Mm. Uh, he has figured out how to transcribe the drum rhythms and that's oh, wow. something that, that, which is huge and i hope yeah. that um he can maybe get that published by indiana university press or something of that nature yeah to document it yeah he really I mean, has a beautiful way of, of showing that for people who are trained in the western tradition i mean i've seen it in our own world here in ireland that within the celtic music you know we're well known for our music and all the rest but over covid that um people were working very hard at documenting um, Irish music, particularly from the older age group that are at that level of their age group about to, you know, move on. And, you know, they were just trying, working really hard and fast, trying to capture as much knowledge as they could because it was so inherited, if you will, you know, and that if that person passed on, forgive me, that knowledge would be lost. And, um, you know, and it was all to do with folklore and the story behind pieces of music, why they were written, the melody lines, the style, you know, differences. Um, and then what they created in our main city of Dublin was this whole library where musicians now can go into to basically research music for their own performances in this modern day. So how important is it, in your opinion, to document music and music history and folkloric music? How important is it? I think it's, uh, this, these are the cultural traditions of a people. I think it's huge, hugely important, no matter what the country. Um, and it's interesting in Haiti, there's an um, anthropologist uh, named Alan Lomax, or maybe he was an ethnomusicologist. He certainly functioned as an ethnomusicologist. He was in Haiti in the 30s. And when 
out into the countryside with a, a, a wax cylinder recorder kind of thing. And the, the, the recordings from that and the movies from that are extraordinary. Fascinating. Um, and uh, there, there are people doing that similar kind of thing now. There's a wonderful drummer named Olele who also has worked with um, uh, Music en bas des étoiles, so Music Under the Stars. And he's traveled the country in, in our current times and has documented uh, you know, the, the voices of the elders who were perhaps children when Alan Lomax was, uh, was traveling amazing. around the country. So that's it, amazing. Yeah, it's, so the connection. Huge. huge yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Now, where can people find out more about your charity and maybe yourself if you're performing somewhere, perhaps? I love well, the channel. Bloomhating.org. Okay, Bloomhating. Uh, dot org or building leaders using music education um, okay we're on uh we have a website we're on facebook we're on instagram we're on linkedin so you're uh, everywhere yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have yeah it's a big task yeah. to keep up with it all yeah big task yeah yeah well it's been great to learn of your story and to have you on and if people want to reach out to you in terms of i have this music musical skill and i want to give back in a charitable way where can they reach out to you? is it through your website yeah, or Janet at bloomhaiti.org, um, or they can find, yeah, if, if uh, people uh, go to the Facebook page, uh, Bloom Haiti Facebook page, they can contact me uh, that way. Our website gives contact information as well. And okay. I actually am leaving for Haiti on the 6th of July through September. I'm not sure how much email access I'll have when I'm there, but... Uh, but somebody will respond to the yeah we might have you back you know when you come back home from haiti just to hear about the latest stories and developments of what you're seeing below there sure um, and that would I be really interesting to, again if i have enough email um internet access i hope to have a blog on our web page right. and on our facebook page great so and for happening okay and donations yeah. then you know if i presume is there a require or a need for more and more instruments to be provided oh. Oh, always. Always. Okay, so if people wanted to donate instruments or give money, can they go to the website and do it all there? Yeah, there's a, the address information for instrument donations and um, uh, their PayPal buttons and things of that nature. Okay, so uh, it would be great to have also um, supplies, instrument repair supplies, now that we're training more and more people the need for i mean this is getting really technical but for example saxophone pads oh is yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and okay. kind of thing and well beyond our, our our resources to provide those kinds of things for the entire country but yeah yeah if people were inspired to to help in that way also we would be but infinitely as i'm as i'm hearing you're speaking i'm hearing of opportunities for people who love the music world and it could be simply learning how to make instruments service those instruments and having that skill and sharing that skill absolutely um, yeah. i don't know what the numbers are in terms of the industry at large but i don't hear very often i've heard in my own country here that there is a huge demand for irish uh instruments to be serviced and maintained and there's a shortage of skill within that area and they're working hard to train more people to get into this area particularly i'm thinking of villain pipes one example so mm -hmm. It seems to me that um, it seems to be an open opportunity and a kind of an industry to itself where people who love the musical world could potentially enter that as a future yeah. choice. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that happens, uh, well, for sure in, in this country and globally, there's a renaissance in string instrument making, for example, the yes. instruments that are coming out of shops today. Yeah. Are, every bit as good as the old Italian masters, you know, it's yeah. very exciting. Very it's exciting. great and I mean the amount of creativity that happened over COVID I think you know people were kind of at home these musicians doing their thing thinking up of new new creativities you know it's it's interesting to see what's coming out now since the pandemic has stopped and we're all back into the world again so that's yeah. been interesting to watch yeah. yeah very interesting well listen it's a pleasure to have you on and to learn of your story and just your website again is bloomhaiti.org that is correct B L U N E. Yes. Bloom, B L U M E dot, uh, sorry, bloomhaiti dot org. Okay, all the links I'll put in the description below anyway. Thank you Great. very much. Wonderful to talk with you, Sylvia.